Welcome to the Storage Super Heavyweights Challenge. Now I want to take an opportunity to introduce you to these fine challengers who stepped up to the plank. We have in seat number one, Adam, the bone crusher from Boulder, coming in at 180 pounds. Thank you very much. And then next to him, we have Eric, the Nasher from New Hampshire, New Hampshire. 190 pounds, he's carrying an extra 10 pounds over his contender. And then we have Chad from EMC, the Terror of Toronto. 175 pounds, he's uh, packing it very tightly. And then finally we have Vaughn, the Nuke from North Carolina. 175 pounds. Now, gentlemen, before we get started, I want to make clear what the rules are here. No rules. We want no gouging, no kicking, no scratching, no biting, no headbutting. You have two minutes with each question. When I say break, you break. I want a nice, good, clean fight. Understood? <laughs> so, uh, can we have our very first question, please? My colleague down here, my esteemed Cody Bunch, please come forward and give our panel a run for their money. Come on, don't be shy. Silence. Yes. The microphone's up at the stands. Please come forward. This is an open session. Anyone can ask any question they like, even if it isn't about storage. Oh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Do we have to just play? Hey, Mike, come Microphone's over here. Come on, don't be shy. Oh, we have a man who stood up. Thank you very much. Okay, we on yet? There we go. So um, let's start out with scaling. How well does fiber channel scale versus NFS? Good question. Right, you have two minutes starting from now. First bout, second sound. Go. So uh, I think, actually, on that question, you asked specifically fiber channel versus NFS. Um, I'll have to punt because what I'm most well versed in is iSCSI, and you didn't ask the right question for an iSCSI guy. And then you're supposed to say, and it scales better than any of the other guys. Yeah. Right? I'm just warming up, dude. It <laughs> goes without saying. iSCSI would be best of the two. No, it's, um, I think there's, there's a lot of VMware rules around them. They're pretty particular, but I'll let um, some of the guys who have NFS and Fiber first? Channel no, no, in we'll one. Let's take it in round robin. Yep. Next contender, please. You have two minutes. Well, um, a lot of the most advanced VMware features around VAAI and some of the other stuff, there's more capabilities in some of that today with fiber channel or block in general than there is with NFS. So part of the question we'll get into, what do you define scaling as being? You know, number of clients, clearly I think NFS can more affordably and more easily connect more different servers into a storage device than you'll easily see with fiber channel. But if you get into other features around the offloading, the array features, or some of the more advanced features, I think you're going to find block today advanced from NFS, even though NFS, I think, has made a lot of uh, headway in the last year with the work VMware and the various VMware partners have done. Okay, good. Uh, Two I, minutes. I say do both and do all, right? So, um, you know, the, the question of scale is a question of what does scale mean, right? So historically there was issues around scaling metadata updates against VMFS 3 that's gotten better from 3.0 to 3.5 to, to 4.0 and now VAI has helped actually uh, VMFS on any block protocol as long as the array supports VAI have uh, similar number of VM per data store scaling but still the number of touch points that are required to manage uh, uh, any block protocol is higher generally than, than NFS. The other key thing about scale is scale of single threaded big I.O. or scale of lots and lots of small I.O. So still, until we add NFS v4, uh, which could have multiple TCP sessions, NFS 4.1 or PNFS natively to VMware, you have to use a single Ethernet connection, which means you better be using 10 gigabit Ethernet if you want to drive a lot of uh, bandwidth to a single data store. So, you know, I, I, I got to be honest with you, my answer for most customers these days is use block, use NAS, and then which block you use depends on what you've got. <laughs> Next contender, please. Great. You'll pay him So I, I think the, the answer lies in what's your storage network of today? Is it fiber channel or is it ethernet based? And what will you continue to be investing in? Um, 
I think the writing's pretty clear and it's on the wall, which is Ethernet. If I have fiber channel, I have one option and one option only. If I have Ethernet, I have multiple options. When I get into multiple options, there is nothing as simple to scale and to grow than NFS. NetApp and VMware have validated both with VI3 and with uh, vSphere that there is no performance difference between the protocols. Now, Chad did bring up one point when you get into some odd, non-common block sizes like 128 kilobyte reads and writes within a host, you're gonna see, you're gonna see about a 20% gain in performance on, on fiber channel over Ethernet versus NFS, but in the four and eight K space, the difference can't be measured. Um, so when you, when you relate, what's the difference then between the protocols? NFS gives a networked file system to the hypervisor and will always give you advanced integration points ahead of anything we can do within vStorage APIs. The APIs require all of us to work together to establish standards, and so vendors who have NFS can develop direct access to array functionality about 30 months ahead of where a VAI standard will be. So we've been giving copy offload of virtual machines, right, things of that nature, deduplication, right, that's transparent, way in advance of vStorage APIs. The right zero stuff, you got that? You, uh, you doing eager zero thick virtual disks all the time? 30 seconds. <laughs> Multipathing IO. <laughs> Multipathing. Now, now. Are we Same. done? Okay, I think we're ready for our next question, please. So who has the best integration with uh, VMware and their products? Ooh. <laughs> oh, that, oh I it. felt that. That was like really to the stomach area. So uh, Eric, can you uh, start us off first if we're doing the round robin? Well, of course I would suggest Dale does. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the integration with uh, VMware, you know, varies across a lot of different products and product spaces. One of the things we're trying uh, very hard to do in Dell, though, is to uh, give a lot of choice in both the protocols and the storage you use and to make these features more accessible or standard to a large number of folks. So, uh, for example, in our Equalogic product family, you know, the VAAI integration, the SRM integration, the standard product feature across the entire product set. So all customers can have access to that capability. It doesn't require a separate purchase or a separate business size in order to use it. I think all storage arrays have a, a very comparable and very good integration with VMware when you look across the environment, but the challenge sometimes gets into what it's going to take for you to deploy that in your environment. And that's both potentially professional services or the effort involved, but it also may be just simply economic of what's the affordability within your organization, what's your budget at any, any given time. And, uh, you know, we're in Dell are very much trying to make that much more affordable, much more common across the in, entire product family with VMware. Chad? EMC is by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, so we have 60 unique... Don't encourage him. We've got six... <laughs> Actually, by the way, I'm not trying to be a doink about it. It's just that was such a nice, polite answer. I thought I'd be non-Canadian and just... Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there's 60 unique integration points that we've got with VMware. There's a broader set of ones that are, are using you know, a broad set of things. You can provision any protocol and any EMC array uh, directly from within vCenter. Our arrays uh, in the unified family, so Clarions and Solaris, actually integrate from the bottom up into the vCenter APIs. So the storage admin, if there's a storage admin and a, a VMware admin, can both get VM object awareness in the relationship with storage. Um, you know, we've basically had broad support you know, for multiple protocols with uh, uh, VMware for a long time. The ability to do you know, file and VM level snapshotting, to be able to do things like auto tiering that ties very well with the idea of DRS. We were the first ones to ship a multipathing plugin, although our friends at, at uh, Dell Equalogic have recently joined us. We obviously, of course, support the native multipathing stuff as well. Um, you know, there's a, such a long list. There's not even enough time to, to talk about You've it. You've got another... Uh, oh, go then I'll keep going. 40 seconds. <laughs> so, so, as an example, who, is, who were the first two vendors that were part of the... the 30 site, seconds. Site Recovery Manager beta? It was Equalogic and EMC, although we were very quickly joined with our brothers here in a broader set of the ecosystem. But we've been shipping fail-back simplicity. It's not the exact not equivalent... Back. Of, of, uh, of an SRM failback, but it helps the whole process failback. 15 seconds. All protocols. <laughs> Recover point gives you VM level view of data protection because it integrates with vCenter. We do it for backup security, management. Literally, the list is almost infinite. Just in time. All right. Another two minutes, my friend. Okay. So I challenge that statement. 
challenge it vehemently. So integration with VMware is, is in, my, in my view, multifaceted. There's direct integration within VMware. So NetApp, NetApp is the only storage vendor on the stage here that provides a unified platform for all protocols, all access points, right? I can connect to the same LUN with iSCSI, Fiber Channel, and FCOE from all different hosts in the same cluster, right? Unified means you change the hardware, but the management tools and the capabilities don't change. I give deduplication for SAN and NAS, compression for SAN and NAS. I give transparency between the virtual machine all the way down to the ports and the fiber switch, the disks that it sits on, right? So I get this transparency. Snapshot-based backups, the only vendor doing hardware-based snapshot backups that your offsite backup copy can also be used with Site Recovery Manager, and there are more integrations on that point coming, right? We've led the way with provisioning hardware-assisted virtual machine clones on any storage platform, provisioning of data stores, automatic growth, right, policies of that nature. But beyond that, right, stop by our booth. Seven cloud orchestration vendors demoing 14 demos. <coughs> we are growing faster than anyone else in the orchestration space because they write one API, right, to one API set for every protocol and every NetApp box or a NetApp box in front of one of these guys' storage arrays or an IBM N series. So orchestration is the next layer. That's how cloud takes off, right? 30 it's seconds. It's a fog and it gets lifted through orchestration. So is it VMware related? If Chad's at 60 and we're at 52, I'm not measuring. Let's go up stack and talk about integration partners. <laughs> And Adam, please. Excellent. Well, of course, the canned answer is that HP's got all of the right advantages here. <laughs> um, you know, for HP in particular, I think we stand in a pretty unique position here. Um, you know, being honest, all these integration points come out. I watch the, you know, watch the Google alerts on the newest integration point. You can bet all four of these names are going to be in that. They're going to be in that list, and we're probably weeks, maybe a couple months apart from each other. And other than you know, the people who are really down in the dirt. I don't know who exactly notices that. But when you look at the list of integrations that are out there, there's VC plugins and SRM and the whole list, VAI and VASA stuff coming, anything on the list, mm -hmm. the answer for us has just been yes, and it's included. And for us, we want to make everything as much as possible just out of the box. So there's a lot of complexity that can come. You can build a million integrations, but if you've got to install 60 things or support a million things or go download 400 things to get this to work, it's a lot of pain for you. For HP, especially in the P4000 area, we're able to put things in box. You just get the default installs or the default product, and you get all of these integration points with it. And the other big thing that's definitely unique when HP goes out and does, does these things is, you know, talk about a VC plugin. A VC plugin from HP isn't going to just do storage. Mm -hmm. It's going to do everything. And that's a huge advantage for HP to have everything in its, you know, bucket of parts to go build a real solution and give you, here's a VC plugin that's got your servers and your storage and the integration point for both there. That's a fair point. Okay, so, <clears throat> what's the verdict? Uh, if they all integrate just as well as each other? I don't know. Can we have our uh, next question, please? Hey, Mike. Yeah, my question goes around storage tiering. And there's different vendors say there is no more tiers anymore. Other people are saying there's multiple tiers. What are your guys' views on this? And uh, can we have Chad first, please? So our view is that uh, solid state is going to is actually not gonna, it's changing the game for, for everybody. So show of hands, who has a solid state drive in their laptop? Everyone who nice. raised their hands. Does anyone want to switch back to an old SATA disk? Anyone? Any show of hands? <laughs> There's a few. Yeah, one guy. <laughs> right, the two guys. Right. The point is that solid state is uh, measured in unit cost per I.O., significantly cheaper than um, uh, Magnetic media is today, one-fifth the cost. The point for us, though, is we get into these vehement arguments over, is the SATA going to, is, is SSDs going to exist in the servers? Are they going to exist as mega caches? Are they going to exist as a, you know, a non-volatile tier where storage sits? And in my view, the, and this is my personal view, uh, the answer is it's going to exist everywhere, right? Um, and actually, over time, probably like 2013, 2014, there will be no place anymore for spinning magnetic media, period, because it will also be cheaper per unit cost per gig. Right? The, the long and the short of it is, is that, in, in our view, you can construct a mega cache fronted uh, 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 array that has a mix of SATA and, and fiber. And that's great. It improves the performance 
of the SATA and the fiber, the SATA to the kind of fiber level that you would have seen in. Forget fiber, the question is 72K RPM versus 15K RPMs, whether they're SAS or whatever. The, 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 the key thing, though, is, is that those things work for something that can be cached. 30 seconds. Certain workloads work great in cache and cache effectiveness and all that sort of stuff. But sometimes it's about constructing a pool of storage at a lower price point, which you can do more effectively if you mix the disk types. But you can only do that if 15 you auto seconds. You're going to see every storage vendor do auto tiering. It's only a question of when and how, just like every storage vendor has to do dedupe. Every storage vendor has to do all of that stuff. And you're it's done. When. Next, please, Vaughn. Good answer. So at NetApp, we actually just re, re, uh, completed an analysis of our largest 60, 60 accounts. And these are accounts that are household names in areas of technology, chip manufacturing, multimedia, online services. Okay. Suffice to say, I can't share the names, right? Financial industry, et cetera. And we looked at the mix of their data based on fiber channel drives and SATA drives and the demand put on these disks. And what was striking was that over the last four years, we've driven the SATA market from basically zero in the enterprise space to about 40% storage capacity within these accounts. And we can conservatively guide all of these customers, not up tier to SSD for performance, but down tier to SATA for storage savings, conservatively guide them towards moving more than 65% of their data set, today at about 40, to about 65% data set downstream. Mm -hmm. SATA is denser, it's cheaper, right? I'm not challenging the burstability or the power draw on SSD, but I am challenging the 20x price tag per gigabyte for SSD. So NetApp has gone about approaching it by providing intelligence in the storage cache that's deduplicated and our SSD modules of flash cache, which come in and provide burstability to any data set on any platform. We've also validated this data by picking on one of you three in a storage paper where we ran 80 virtual machines running an OLTP database workload. 30 seconds. We ran it on half the disk footprint than you guys with a flash cache and achieved 40% performance gain over what you guys could deliver. So when you're a customer and I'm saying, I'll get green by cutting your footprint in half. 15 that's seconds. That's pretty green. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else do something like that? Adam? <laughs> no, I don't believe so. That's so, like saying there's no top shelf liquor. <laughs> I think it's Adam's round. So uh, if I heard the question right, it heard sound to me and you guys are answering it that way too, that is tiering important or You've heard somebody say tiering isn't important. I'd be surprised to understand who said tiering isn't important or anybody would deny that. That's, to me, you know, there's a lot of tiering. There's different strategies. You guys just talked about some details about specific strategies for tiering, whether it's caching or SSD. Um, for me, simply put, uh, doing a lot of storage expertise for years in the industry, I don't think you could ever argue that there's one disk technology that can solve every use case. All of us have been juggling around, do I do SATA or 15K for VMware? What do I do for Exchange? What about my databases? I mean, that's been expertise that admins have been expected to deal with and solve over and over again, and it shifts. You know, you get SSDs right now, there's not one type of SSDs. You know, there's people at different booths here, and they're all different types of black magic that do different speeds and have different reliabilities. That's very confusing. You know, as I mentioned before, trying to get everything out of box, where, where I think tiering is going to end up going is the goal would be to build tiering that solves that case for you, that you get to a place where it's not your problem if this is an exchange database or, or a, you know, a VM or whatever it is, that the, the arrays can figure out how to put stuff on the right disk technology that's going to give you the best bang for buck and capacity and still meet your performance requirement, which is something that without tiering is really hard to do manually. So, yeah, it's very important. And same thing as, you know, integrations. I think you're going to watch the seconds. four of us fight against each other um, day in and day out on who's got the better tiering technology and who's going to get it first. Customer wins in the end. Yes. Yes, competition breeds, breeds better technologies. Customers and Eric? Um, uh, fully agree. It's not a, it's, everyone's going to use tiering in some form in their environments. I think the, the maturity that's going to be happening in the industry, no, though, and we're seeing it starting now, is first the automation of that. And then the next challenge that I think we're all running into is how do you measure beforehand on given workloads, what's the appropriate tiering strategy for the workload? Right now, I think most all of us, uh, while we have automatic tiering in our product and we're happy to sell you, you know, a bigger tier or a smaller tier of any given size, 
you're pretty much left to your own devices to figure out is your workload tiered and how and what is the cost effective tiering of it. So, you know, for example, it's very hard to look at a file system and understand active data sets or inactive data sets. And clearly the size of your caching or your tiering is directly related to your ability to understand your workload. The other challenge I think we're all running into in this, which is not a storage problem, but it's an application problem, is best practice of applications for the last 30 years is spread your data, don't cause a hotspot. Right. Now, we are collectively going to tell all the application providers, please give us the biggest or the smallest hotspot you can, thank you very much, because we can tear the hell out of that. We actually now hate workloads that are almost perfectly random across a data set because they don't lend themselves very well to tiering. The, the, the algorithms keep chasing the data around trying to find the tiering mechanism. So tiering is here to stay. Uh, it is going to be highly automated. And the applications and the tooling uh, really need to grow up such that you can seconds. learn uh, you know, what's appropriately tiered and what's not without doing the trial and error method of, of deployment. OK, thank you very much. Oh, I see a man from the UK wants to ask a question. Yeah, Go ahead, Simon. Okay, and uh, so Vaughan, it's your question to take first. So the majority of you have uh, established your market share by essentially selling bespoke silicon today. Okay, now in the compute market, sorry, in the compute market, we've seen everybody move from, you know, very uh, bespoke hardware stacks of compute resource to commodity scale-out stuff. So where do you see storage being in the next five years? So the question was, where do I see storage going in the next five years? I think there are some, some lots of changes on the horizon, right? So we've just had this discussion about storage tiering and different ways to go about it. Should I move my data? What if my data is random? Do I have to chase it to try to move it, right? Is it better to address it in a cache and have, have you know, logic address it? Um, you know, Chad made a mention a few minutes ago, right? Some standards are going to come in within the storage space around space reclamation, around deduplication around being more agile, right? There's this um, big shift that if we would have had this conversation five years ago, he said, there's no way someone would have, would, would have you know, came up and said I could run my, my VMware environment on NAS or do it on a deduplicated footprint. So where do I see us in five years? I see large data centers still leveraging large hardware and storage controllers. Um, I see you're going to see a lot more vendors trying to come with a unified platform because unification gives you simplicity and consistency within your practices and within your tool sets. I think you're going to see um, some of us uh, within the industry start to, to do more in the way of software-based arrays, right? Following some of the, some of the left-hand technology. That was, that was some great in, uh, innovation and, and leadership. And I think you're going to see solutions that start to address branch offices, smaller departments that are giving you arrays that are software-based and, and leveraging the hypervisor uh, so that you can have a smaller footprint and basically the, what about the concept like a data center in a box but still have no trade-off in your management tool sets your replication your data protections right your storage efficiencies and so uh, I think you're gonna have a hardware software mix in the future of your storage controllers and again consolidation unification okay Adam please yeah if I would heard the uh, the whole question right too you're asking a bit about the difference between commodity and kind of proprietary controller technology yep. thanks okay, I was just checking to make sure that's it yeah I think um, you're on on the right track there everything I'm seeing from the the future of storage is that if somebody isn't on an x86 kind of commodity architecture they're talking about trying to get there um, that's everything I'm hearing uh, the the products I've been working on most of the time are x86 based the advantages are limitless there as far as how far you can go and how fast you can innovate a storage platform um, when you're not working through all the, the issues of a proprietary hardware stack. Um, so I think, I believe absolutely, and I guess I've been living in that world for a long time, not necessarily that we're just going there, and a lot of products out there, they're there, um, and a lot of products are trying to get there to that commodity, you know, x86 based hardware stack. Um, as far as general innovation in storage, you know, the Vaughn mentioned, you know, some of the standards that are coming up. If you're interested in storage innovation, you're in the right place. Um, from my view, as much as I've worked in storage, there's nothing pushing as hard on storage to innovate and to improve and to do things better than virtualization is. Um, the stuff that came up in VAAI, you know, why is that not possible on a lot of other operating systems? Everybody's copying files around. Can we offload all of it? You know, yep. there's, there's a ton of interesting things going on in storage, and um, you know, maybe it's because of the role I play doing storage with VMware, but it seems like 
the virtualization environment is pushing storage the hardest. So watch the features that come up with storage and virtualization and, and start demanding that they show up in other application stacks too and really we get seconds. this innovation everywhere else. Okay, okay. Eric? So uh, I think all storage controllers to some level are going to be somewhat proprietary, that people aren't going to be building their systems out of pure white boxes. I think you'll look at the chipsets, there'll be a lot of commonality, whether it's x86, x64, or LSI controllers or whatever. But I, I don't see that it all is going to go, uh, you know, commodity down to white box. That would start for storage arrays to start. The, the, the conclusion of that would be storage arrays would be simply a software product. And the strong argument would be, therefore, we would go completely vertically uh, integrated or unified, i.e. storage arrays wouldn't exist. There would just be the, the virtualized servers that are running everything. And while that's a possible vision some people are, are pushing, I think there is a, um, an obsolescence event that occurs because storage arrays generally have a longer life cycle uh, because of their costs and other things than you see in servers. And that life cycle is going to dictate uh, some level of separation in the behaviors of that. Um, I do think that um, the automation is going to continue such that over time all the, the management interfaces we keep talking about, the storage arrays, the next step in this is for actually for them to start going away. So rather than us arguing about you're integrated with this or that, you're going to see it actually just integrated out of the box directly in some feature, for example, from VMware or something like that. And so I think the storage interfaces in some ways are going to back down and you're going to see a higher level infrastructure interface manager, be it cloud, be it uh, something else, starting to take over in that over a longer period of time. Now, we as storage vendors, um, We'll um, push and pull on that at various points in times. We may like it, we may dislike it, but I think that's going to be a general trend in that because the ultimate unification of storage is actually, seconds. it appears to be unified more with the server and the virtualization environment directly. Great Chat? answer. Great answer. So, so for those of you that know me, I'm not normally this much of a doink, right? But I'm going to make, uh, to make this fun, I'll make it a little more blunt. EMC sells about $11 billion a year of servers. Commodity x86 servers. Every single EMC storage platform, from the smallest of our unified all the way up to our biggest, are basically a commodity you know, cluster of x86 based hosts that run software. All the software that's developed within EMC, all of it, for all the platforms, is developed first as a VM. Right? The reason that we made that, and by the way, one of them is a clustered scale out cluster of x86 things, right? a server that basically scales from two to 16 nodes in a cluster today attached to 2,400 back-end disks. We made that massive engineering investment because we were freaked out. We were freaked out because people were starting to have so much compute, so much I.O. capacity above the storage that unless we could scale out, unless we could move towards complete comp commodity hardware, we wouldn't be able to support it. Now, you don't need to have the same number of cores you know, on, the, on the storage arrays that you need to have on the hosts, right? You don't, you don't need to. But you can't have like a tenth, a hundredth, right? So currently, uh, you know, a uh, small low-end EMC array has eight cores, and the biggest ones that we sell today have like 256 cores. Mid-range arrays from us in the future will have up to 192 cores. 30 seconds. We, we've bet completely and fully to the tune of our, our, our entire product line that commodity scale out x86 is going to win on the back end. Now, the question is, will those software assets 15 seconds. be used on servers without EMC storage? You betcha. Go to the EMC hands-on lab, you can see all of our products running as VMs on a giant scale out commodity VMAX. Yeah. A big Down to the wire. <laughs> Cheap. That's okay. That's Could we okay. have our next question, please? Hey, um, securing a virtualized infrastructure stack versus securing a physical infrastructure stack is very, very different. Um, as you try to federate in a public or pr private cloud environment, it even becomes more pronounced. Please explain the initiatives at each one of your firms for security in highly virtualized environments and the differences between your own platforms. Thank you. Adam. Sure. The, the priorities, um, you know, I had conversations with uh, some end users just this morning. We were asking, I'm seeing a lot more and more questions 
um, specifically around, um, especially for the IP-based SANs, specifically asking for a lot more encryption um, capabilities out there. Uh, there's a lot of flavors of that. We're trying to sort out a lot more um, better answers than, than some of the third-party tools that are really available out there today. But they're asking for, um, I think, two things at once that really lead to their security, a lot more multi-tenancy capabilities um, and more encryption capabilities. Um, the multi-tenancy one has become interesting in particular for the P4000 group. We're starting to see people kind of, you know, to the conversation about the, the VM-based storage and x86-based storage, we're starting to see the combination of the virtual SAN appliance that we've put out there and the combination of physical storage to start building multi-tenancy environments that are a lot more secure because everybody's really got their own SAN, but they're still on a shared infrastructure. Um, so and there's a lot of different angles at that. The one that I think um, still needs, you know, a, a ton of the work was the, the pieces of encryption that are, there's the on-the-wire piece and the at-rest piece that need a lot better answers. The multi-tenancy um, and being able to do uh, separate environments for all these users in a, in a cloud or in a uh, service provider type architecture. We're doing pretty well um, mostly with the, the split between virtual appliance based storage so every customer gets their own and then still a, a shared physical infrastructure. Thank you. And Eric, please. I don't know that the storage environment alone is responsible for the security of the virtualization environment. It, it clearly plays a part in that, but I think the security of the, of the virtualization environment is a larger question, and clearly there are some folks on here that have other parts of their product business that deal with some of those capabilities. At the storage array levels, the, the, the security is a lot of times around um, is the data at rest, the data in flight. We're really not seeing a lot of data in flight uh, uh, encryption going on today. While I IPsec is a standard, it's really not very commonly deployed. It's, it's still too expensive uh, uh, to manage it in a lot of ways, as well as maybe some of the hardware costs. Uh, we're very much working on trying to reduce that and make that easier for controlling the infrastructure. Um, SED drives will do a lot for de dealing with the data at rest, but the, then the, we're really going to start to walk into the virtualization environment. And I think there's going to be another discussion in the virtualization environment around how the multi-tenancy lends itself as in down into array integration, that the array integration can actually support and help the multi-tenancy environment rather than sort of being passive to it, which today in many array environments are passive or they create a, another virtual SAN that, that separately operated and managed somewhat for that. And then finally, performance is part of this security thing. A lot of people can, would consider their service levels a key part of, of, their, perform, of their environment because if, if an application can be denied service but it wasn't otherwise seconds. broken into, there is still a real challenge there. And so, uh, we've worked very closely with VMware on the SIOC and some of the other new features that we're working on for the VM awareness, trying to allow there to be a much clearer understanding of the administrator's seconds. intent of performance and reliability down into the storage systems to ensure service levels. Thank you. And Chad? So RSA is the security division of, of EMC, and that's going to be the bulk of my focus here. Uh, I think data at rest encryption and uh, it's just going to become just a mandatory checks box for every array. In fact, I'll even openly state we've lost deals to, uh, to uh, at the very high end because we support it in the mid-range, but we don't support it yet um, on, on the VMAX that's coming in Q4. I think it's just a checkbox. I don't think that that's the answer in virtualized environments. Fundamentally, that's just going to have to be a given, right? Our view is that the security model has to be embedded with the VM. The VM is the object. The VM is going to be mobile. It's part of the policy, and all of the other things need to carry with that. What that means is that encryption is going to have to be part of the core VMware stack, and that's something that RSA and VMware are working on together very closely today. But the key thing, and if you don't understand entirely why it's got to move with the VM, if you understand why you know, VAP, uh, vShield app and, and vShield zones are an important idea, the same thing applies to encryption. It's got to travel with it not be part of the infrastructure. Where RSA has been really, really focused, and this week we GA'd, I don't know if anybody saw it in the VE super session, we demonstrated it, is the idea of being able to show compliance and hardening of the entire virtualized stack. 160 uh, uh, VMware uh, security hardening guidelines, all enforced, audited, visible, clear, and simple. Peace, people don't virtualize, or at least some people give excuses not to virtualize, because they go, I, unless you can demonstrate PCI or HIPAA compliant, I won't stick it on there. We've GA the capability to demonstrate that. But the other place where they're doing a ton of research between Intel, VMware, and RSA is embedding it in the hardware root of trust 
and actually making it so that we can geotag VMs as they move around the clouds. Multi-tenancy, by the way, is an interesting seconds. thing. At the infrastructure layer, people who use salesforce.com don't run it on multi-tenant storage. Multi-tenancy is done at higher up at the stack fundamentally, and that trickles down through the entire stack. <laughs> Two seconds in your end. Vaughn? Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm not sure who stated it earlier, but there was a very good point, which is storage isn't the be-all, end-all uh, for security. And so I will, will rephrase some of the points that were made. I can look at, at security of my object, which in terms of is, is, can be measured in terms of data at rest. If someone takes my disk drive, can they read that data? I can look at it in terms of if someone's snooping my wire, can they read that data? So can I do encryption, right? So there are disk drives and standards that are available today from the disk drive manufacturers that allow us to have our data encrypted on disk, check, done. Uh, <clears throat> NetApp's to crew data for it is licensed by many switch vendors and you can buy that add-on module along with our key management to encrypt your data in flight so that someone's snooping your fiber channel or ethernet networks, you can be ensured that they can't read your data. Done. Check. I've got stack solutions based off of VMware and my storage controller technologies that, that leverage technologies from Cisco that allow us to build isolated stacks that ensure that <clears throat> as we delegate out our virtualized infrastructure for different business units, right? Maybe I don't want my finance folks looking at HR records, looking at records for, for another business unit. That these folks can come in and manage and run their business as if they had their own isolated stack with network and hardware, but are actually on a shared, uh, shared infrastructure and a shared resource, right? Is that security? Well, it's keeping one business unit from bleeding into the others. I think there are, there are additional, additional areas which are gonna secure how do we access our objects, as Chad brought up. How do we ensure that our objects aren't leaving our building and, and, and virtual machines are tagged? So I think the scope of this discussion is much broader than any set of technologies that any one of us has to offer. Uh, and I think you're going to see it continue to grow. 15 seconds. So what I would share with you in, in terms of our you know, secure multi-tenancy stack, uh, you know, we're having phenomenal success with that within the federal space and expect that you'll see more of that uh, from that uh, solution between now and Europe. Oh, 0.5 <laughs> of a second. <laughs> Sorry. Are we on to Eric next? The next mm -hmm. question. Okay. Can we have the next? I would get lost in my round robin. And we have another question, please. Mr. Steve Beaver, the famous Steve Beaver. And my question is this: Who has the most robust and easily managed replication op options available when regards to disaster recovery? Oh, that's a good question. That's so I think we're on to Eric. Yep. Uh, well. You know, these are when you're asking who does, it's almost the mandatory answer of the course is we do, right, for, for us. <laughs> the uh, uh, replication in uh, uh, Dell's Equalogic storage products is the standard product feature. It's, so it's affordable, it's out of the box with the product, it can run with any other uh, storage device without any add-ons or any requirement around host software. The SRM integration is a standard feature for that also. So one part of this discussion, I guess, in ease of use, I guess we could count, we could have a discussion of are we counting clicks? And candidly, I don't know the number of clicks for my colleagues here on the screen, so I, I, I can't get into that debate of whether the clicks are more or less. I believe the ease of use in this, though, is part of this is the, both the affordability and the conceptualization. Is the feature common in the product? Does it work across multi-generations of devices without your having to think about it? Can it be operated by normal people? Is the integration with major application areas a standard feature as an add-on? And I think if you use some of these business management criteria, I think we have a very, uh, very good solution in our product space, and we have a lot of customers that uh, use it because of that. Yeah, I'll give you a pat on the back. I agree with that. I agree with that. Okay. Chad, please. So, uh, you know, going from the lowest to the low of the highest to the high, that the challenge is that every customer is fundamentally different, right? So, uh, you know, a broad, a broad set of solutions mean that you've got the breadth to address a broad set of requirements. Some of our customers, this may seem foreign, but there's many of you in the audience that will nod your head at this, and there'll be some people who'll be like, what are you talking about? Basically ask us to replicate 8,000 devices, 10,000, 20,000. They expect to have consistency groups across boatloads of stuff 
that measure in the hundreds of thousands. Right? They expect to have journaling, CDP, continuous data protection models. Right? But conversely, some people just want to be able to go, yeah, I want to take this array, which is an iSCSI target, replicate this array, iSCSI target, or an NFS server, replicating to an NFS server. In that example, as an example, the feature costs $10,000 at the slow end, at the low end, and basically would provide everything that you need to, need to have, right? So I do think that fundamentally customers' business requirements vary, right? And, uh, you know, as a similar question, sometimes people need homogeneous replication. Sometimes they need heterogeneous replication. Again, those are all things that we do. We provide that breadth of capability in their portfolio. And, you know, I, if I ask, we'd see probably about 40% of the customers that are, are here using, you know, EMC or using EMC replication products. It's something that we built our business on. I do think that actually there's some stuff that we could learn, being frank, from seconds. primarily these, these folks, but also you guys too, about making it even simpler, right? So we've been focused at the high. We know that we need to drive it down across the entire band. Cool. Thank you. And phone. So I believe Stephen's question was, which of you have the most robust and the most elegant replication? And so I'm going to walk out on, and put myself on the, uh, the big arrow and target on, a big target on my back and let you guys throw arrows at me. It's NetApp. We have one replication technology called SnapMirror. It does synchronous, semi-synchronous, asynchronous, replicates over IP and over fiber. And at any time, I can stop and change the method of replication. I can do it from my lowest end array to the highest end array. Customers that use our simulators in their lab environments, which are software-based controllers, can replicate to physical and physical back to software-based. Right? Again, we have a fundamental difference in the way we view storage controller technologies and the other guys. We have one unified controller platform with a replication built into the platform. Hardware is hardware. Today it's X number of cores. Tomorrow it will be Y number of cores. We replicate from fiber disk to SATA from SATA to fiber, from the highest in system to the lowest. That's flexibility, that's power, and that allows customers to learn it once, right? It's like mentally, set it and forget it. I know how to replicate, and I know my tools, and I know how to write my integration points with my cloud orchestration partners for, for replication, and I'm done. No exceptions, not this array requires this, this array requires that, I have a software base, I have a host base, it, it replicates. And, and to Eric's point, driving into the application stack is where it really matters, right? So our integration points with Site Recovery Manager is a perfect example for this audience. Go okay, ahead. thank you. And Adam. So uh, I love this question. It's, it's something that at least our product set, I think, has the most strength in. You know, when, when I look at the other products that are out there, so there's the stuff uh, Eric was talking about. It's the you know, built-in, integrated, super easy to use replication that can go over practically any IP link, high latency, low speed, super low cost. Yep, there's a ton of similarity. We could probably sit down and take pot shots at each other's products over little, you have two clicks, I've got one, whatever, three, I don't know. You know I haven't tried yours. Those two replication technologies are probably very similar. I've seen that actually play out in real customer environments that tell us, oh wow, those, those two in their SRM, yeah, pretty cool. Um, I think that part's great, and SRM technology in general for a DR plan has gone out, gone really well. Um, you know, pretty much every array that's, no offense to those who don't, any array that's any array has SRM integration, and it better all work end to end, or I don't know why you're hanging out at this trade show. You, it's kind of a table stakes thing you got to have with that SRM integration. Support but, release, your release? Yeah. And uh, the, the thing that's really unique, though, um, we've got abilities to do synchronous replication, you know, multi-site systems that pretty much nobody else can do, and even anybody who tries to take a shot at it, they look at, you know, I'm gonna do a long distance V-motion or something like that, to try to build the environments we can do in a multi-site scenario, they're gonna shell out something that to start the conversation, you're in six-figure land just to even talk about the software to get it done. We've got solutions that do multi-site SAN, so we've got support for VMware seconds. fault tolerance, HA, DRS, everything VMware does in a synchronous replication environment, and we include that with our $25,000 starter SAN. As you know, out of the box, that's the way the system works. Nothing complex about it. Cool. Thank you very much. Except you can't start doing that for 25 minutes. We'll see a gentleman <laughs> here by the microphone. Would you like to come up and uh, give us your question, please? Yeah. For VDI deployments, in order to find the right balance between a low, low storage footprint and increased performance, 
which technology is, is better, a compression, data dedupe, or a combination, or some other form of technology? And I think we're on to chat, yes? So did anyone see, <clears throat> with View 4.5, we published a reference architecture that I believe, although these things are transient, sets a new watermark, $38 per client for the cost of storage all in. The most important technology for IO density, and IO density is actually the larger challenge versus the capacity question. In other words, how many spindles do you need to support the IO workload, right? By the way, to be clear, if you guys read my blog post, I said that was this IO profile, this is how it works with the, it's, that's right, it was six IOPS, I believe yours was four. <laughs> so, 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 by the way, we also published one that it was 20 IOPS and it's about $50 per client. Now, the most important technology in all of that, frankly, is mega cache, which we both do, right? Uh, because the ability to absorb the IO impact, uh, and, and uh, by the way, just so it's fair, you guys did it first, they led the way, each one of us leads in certain things, and if it's a good idea, people follow. Right? That's not, that's, that's not a bad thing, so kudos, right? Now, by the way, I, I think that the other things to reduce the user space, uh, the consumption, particularly with persistent desktops, deduplication is very important. The way we do deduplication today is at the file object layer, and we do compression at the block layer. Uh, you can expect, by the way, just at, like in the same example of every one of us, first, second, third, lead. Seconds. Uh, I expect that you, you should view all forms of deduplication, single instancing of files, compression, and block level eventually become pervasive. And yes, that is a roadmap commit just for anyone who's curious. But in the VDI use case, 15 seconds. the mega cache, in other words, can you create a large cache that can absorb those IOs, is the most important thing to creating cost-effective VDI configs, period. And phone? Can I buy extra time? <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a little, little bit, a little bit of disagreement that I have here with with my good friend, which is, uh, if you look at customers who have deployed virtual desktops in the in the the five figure seat count and the six figure seat count, they are predominantly NetApp customers and is based on a couple of driving forces. One is we are the leader in Ethernet connected storage and Ethernet has a much cheaper per port cost than fiber channel interconnect. Most of those also run on NFS, which gives you greater scaling historically in the number of clients that you can put in a storage pool. We also were the first vendor to do hardware assisted virtual machine cloning, giving you immediate zero cost virtual machine clones. We've integrated that with a number of connection brokers, be it Quest to be Workspace, Citrix and Desktop, VMware's View Manager, right? There's a roadmap of convergence between hardware-assisted clone technologies and what you're going to be have available between right, our, uh, our desktop managers and provisioning tools, so the, the future will always get better in that space. From a standpoint of storage efficiency, okay, I can block-level data deduplicate any virtual machine image on any storage platform on any controller I have. It's not a, it works here on this protocol, right? There's none of this mix and match. So it works anywhere, so if you've got a preference of how you want to connect, we don't care. From a standpoint of serving your data on a very, very dense footprint, right, this is where things become very unique. There are diametrically opposing forces in the virtual desktop space. The running state of a virtual desktop is literally nothing. 20 seconds. But you have these huge I.O. storms where the, the requirement to serve that workload can be somewhere in the range of hundreds of X in scale. To be able to serve data that Ten is seconds. deduplicated and across virtual machine store one object of binary sets across multiple desktop images in cache and serve and pin it in cache and serve hundreds of thousands of users from a cache image and now only take their rights oh. in for disk. Stop! I accept your Right. And Adam. Uh, real quick, who asked the question? Was it, was it actually VDI specific? Yeah. So um, the reason I asked that, so when you ask a question like, um, you know, should I be looking more at compression or dedupe or which is more important, um, I think really, for me, I, I would want to bucket a whole long list of features that are, all go into this one category, which is we're trying to get more space out of the same container 
with you know the tools you have and you know everybody's done thin provisioning we went after that you know dedupes a good technology compressions one that's talked about being able to do linked cloning type technologies is another one and all of those are after let's get you more usable capacity out of your system right um, I think it t comes down to use case after you get through some of them thin provisioning is pretty much effective everywhere for VDI I think linked cloning type technology being able to do that being able to do you know I think almost all of us have some sort of linked cloning type technology in the array. I'm not positive about everybody. No ours, no NetApps. Um, but you know, you've got that strategy in there. Dedupe, I think, comes actually next in is specific to VDI because it's a use case that lends itself well to Dedupe. I don't think, my opinion, I don't think um, compression would do as well in a VDI use case just because it's really this repetition of a ton of files. But it's different per use case. So I wanted to know the use case. Yes, other use cases, dedupe might be horrible for and just do nothing but hurt performance on you, and compression was better, or thin provisioning was better, or you know, another thing that goes in that bucket of saving space, all the thin provisioning integration, um, it came up earlier in storage seconds. futures. Um, the thin provisioning integration, so we can just start freeing up why are we all holding on to zeros all the time. That's another technology that gives us more space inside of our systems today. Um, so they matter per use case. Some of them are my favorites. Dedupe's honestly not my favorite because there's some use cases it isn't perfect for. Um, there's some technologies 15. that are coming that have no performance impact and work on every use case that'll free up space. And Eric. The first question I, I have, uh, I guess, back is, are we talking about VMware's VDI? Or are we talking about Citrix or which, which, which application platform? Because they have a very different feature set when you get into the application platforms. You know, prior to VMware uh, using a lot of link clones uh, with, with the view products, um, clearly dedupe was the winner in, in the world because VMware had no disk space sh saving sharing environment, and uh, dedupe was king in that. With the view environment for the, for the block environment, the dedupe capabilities for the core images stuff are much more under control. There is still some benefit of a dedupe type solution, but as compared to the previous benefit provided, it's pretty well down. And the, the, the other side of the cost equation is the tiering discussion we had earlier, that when you're going to go into this VMware link clones or deduped environment, tiering, tiered storage arrays are almost mandatory in these types of workloads or they won't fly. Now, the other big consumption of disk space in VDI environments is, is, are the user files. And, you know, typical best practice today is to put the user files in a share of some type. I mean, you can try to force it in the block, but, uh, you know, uh, Windows and Microsoft can make that pretty difficult on you. You do better just to do folder redirection for my documents and things like that. And in that scenario, when you're getting into the file system, um, the file system optimization type of capabilities, you could call it a form of dedupe, but it's not the block-based dedupe that many of us seconds. may be familiar with. It's going to be, a, you know, compression on super steroids or other types of things is going is to turn out to be highly effective. And in a lot of environments over time, your mail folders and everything else are going to be much seconds. larger than your VDI images. And so as these environments grow and you bring it to more professional workers, what you're doing in the, fi in the file system optimization is going to be key long term. OK. Well, two things. I think we have uh, enough time for one more question, but we're going to do it as a lightning round, so it'll be one minute each. If you have asked a question, please stay, don't leave, because we have, by courtesy of High Trust, an iPad to give away. What I'm going to ask is for everybody who's asked a question to stand up, and I'm going to ask the panel to select one of the people out of the people who have asked questions, which was the best question, and that's who will award the iPad to. So for those people who've stepped up to the breach and asked a question, there's going to be a reward for doing that. So can we have the, the last question, but it's one minute only, please, per, per uh, candidate. Leave it to somebody else. Somebody in EMC yeah. I think yeah. at the back we've got a, a question. Yes. It's working. Yep. Uh, cost for the hard drive at Best Buy for one terabyte is $200. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what are the initiatives uh, each one of you are taking to reduce the cost of SAN without uh, compromising the performance? Okay, and I think it's Vaughn next. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep. Go. One minute. So it's, it's interesting. If you look at the hardware components that make up our storage controllers, we all source from the same drive manufacturers, the same chipset manufacturers. Actually, a lot of our, our chassis and whatnot are assembled by and produced by a lot of similar manufacturers. So we have a lot of very 
similar save, uh, similar uh, cost structures in our in our controllers. Um, I did find it interesting when there was discussions around running um, storage controllers on on white box hardware or you know server platforms that you, know, you would think that cost would be passed along to the savings or to the customers, yes. right? But uh, uh, we constantly try to drive down costs, and there's two means to do it. The first one is is, is the reduction in in the, the cost from the suppliers brings down our cost. Uh, we always reassess based on competitive pressures to bring down our price points. But we also look to driver, deliver more value inside of the storage controller. So 15 whether that's seconds. Giving you increased storage capacity through storage savings technologies, whether it's giving you more functionality, feature integration points, that's the difference between what we're selling and the hard drive off the shelf at Best Buy. Okay, Adam. Yeah, the, the hardware off the shelf at Best Buy, I mean, it's just a single disk drive. And I think that cost although I, I doubt Best Buy is making much off that drive, you'll never probably see that actually show up at our level in these arrays with the type of technology that we're putting out there and the features we're putting out there. But you'll see it catch up. It's kind of like a curve that we're catching up with. Um, I think uh, it was, this year we've got you know, products that retail price are a dollar per gig with all of this feature set in that we've talked about. You know, that starts to match what was in that store just a couple years ago. It's all that feature set we've talked about here. Um, so thin provisioning, automated tiering, dedupe, compression, all of those are after giving you more usable capacity and really driving down that cost of storage. You know, if it wasn't for the cost of storage, we'd just throw SSDs at everything and not care how many IOPS you had. So it's all of those feature set, and I think you see us all prioritizing them differently, but we're all talking about the same kind of technologies to drive down the cost of storage and still deliver you high availability and redundancy and all of this sophistication that, that costs something to build and deliver. And Eric, please. Um, the challenge with the, the drive from Best Buy is there's, there's no management tools to help you with it. And so at, at the end of the day, uh, you're, you're paying us individually or collectively uh, for the management capabilities and the data protection we're providing for you. Um, the, the disk drive, like the electricity, it candidly is a commodity and part of the system. And that's, you know, while it appears that's what we're charging you for, that's not what we're charging you for. We're charging you for that data protection and management and the integration, and that's what you're not going to see. On the performance side, those highest density drives, at least until at some point in time in the future, and I'm not sure it's as soon as Chad would suggest, uh, moves to uh, memory-based technology or solid-state technology, 15 seconds. I, I think you're going to be tiering storage for performance reasons. I don't think the Fry's is going to be selling the high-performance storage device for a while. Thank you. And finally, Chad. So what's weird is... Um, Service providers that hit us up now for storage are asking for super scale out, super low cost. They want to sell you a storage service that's 10 cents a gig a month, um, right? As soon as you approach the 200 terabyte kind of level of scale, which sounds big for an individual, but it's actually pretty small for a, for a service provider, believe it or not, we'd all rapidly approach the cost of disk in the array, yep. right? So as it scales up, the unit cost goes down. The initial you know, cost element in all of our cost structures is the management software, the value that we provide around those things. We've actually been making big bets, and it, you know, we saw you guys move into this area uh, also recently, right? To go, there's probably another storage model which is huge globs 15 seconds. of object storage that is literally DAS in a server that looks like, uh, that looks like S3, right? So, and that's EMC Atmos. Uh, which basically drives down that cost even way below that, but operates that at exabyte scales. That's something that is important to a different type of storage. Okay, um, can I have the people who have asked questions to be upstanding and everybody else to stay seated? There we are. I never thought we would get through this many questions this in great. such a yeah, short right. period of time. Great. We had many, many good questions that really had these guys on the ropes, <laughs> if you forgive the pun. Uh, but gentlemen, out of the questions that we've had, which one really stood out to you as being the one that really had you on the ropes? I actually really liked the uh, questions around replication and the one around storage efficiency of the VDI. That, that's my two votes. Do we concur? I'd actually say storage efficiency was the one that stands out to me because that's where we're all aiming to be as efficient as we can. Yes, yeah, so you mean the VDI, this yeah, guy I, right I think, here, think, right? With the it, coffee cup? Yeah, yeah I think VDI. it was the VDI question. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. So we, we think it's the VDI guy who gets the iPad. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. 
Courtesy of High Trust. Thank you very much, High Trust. I don't want to take it away from you. <laughs>